Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to our discussion. We're so glad that you have joined us once again. As we take our little trip through the Bible rather quickly this time, uh, we're going to uh, do some reading in the book of 2 Timothy. And let's go clear to the last chapter, I believe it is, chapter 3, and clear to the end of that, starting with verse 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now, yeah. if I understand it right, Scripture means writing. Yes. So are we to, to we include, uh, conclude that all writing is inspired by God? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to hold that question a little bit because we're going to discuss it in some detail a little bit later. Let's talk about what were the circumstances under which this was written because we always like to know that. Remember that Paul was imprisoned twice in Rome, probably about two years each time. Um, and in, in between, there was a period of about two years in which he was free and traveled around and helped to build up the churches and so forth that he had, he had helped to establish earlier. So uh, Paul was rearrested in Troas, as we read last time, and taken straight to Rome with the accusation that he had been responsible for setting Rome on fire. Of course, um, that was impossible if anyone really cared about the truth because Paul was far gone from Rome at the time when that fire occurred, and we all know that that fire was actually set by Nero himself. But he was looking for a reason to blame other people, and so he first of all blamed Christians, and then there was a huge persecution of Christians, and thousands of Christians were killed in Rome itself. It gives you just a little idea, I mean, of, of the incredible growth speed of growth, or maybe I should say, of the Christian church back in Paul's day. I mean, in Rome itself, thousands of people had become Christians, and thousands, well, thousands were killed. We don't know how many else were left alive. But then when uh, things weren't going too well, and the Jews still had this incredible hatred of Paul, and recognizing that Nero's second wife was an apostate Jew, the Jews decided to work through her, and they tried to pin on Paul the charge that he had been responsible for that fire which had destroyed about half of Rome. And as a result of that, Paul was rearrested in Troas, taken to Rome, where he was twice arraigned before, before Nero, before he was finally sentenced to be beheaded. So this is Paul's last imprisonment. Do we know where he was at this time? Anybody where he was being kept? Remember, in his first imprisonment, it says clearly that he was allowed to hire his own house. He was under a kind of house arrest. Where is he at this time? The Mamertine prison. Mamertine, well, <laughs> maximum security. Yeah, maximum security prison, yeah. Um, we don't know if he was there for the whole time. Usually people who ended up in the Mamertine prison, they were only there for a short time, and from there they went to be killed. But at least for a while, Paul was in the Mamertine prison, and you can still visit that Mamertine prison if you choose to go to Rome and you look for it. It's, it is a church, of course, built over it, but you can go down into the very uh, stone, basically a place carved out of the stone, um, there not too far from the Roman Senate. So there was Paul in that environment. Do we know anything about anybody else who was there maybe at that time? Oh, come on, we can do better than that. 
anybody else? The people that were helping him, is that what you're talking about? Well, anybody who, anybody who was with was, Paul. Was Silas there? No. Luke, Luke, Timothy? Luke was usually around. Second Timothy 4, 11, only Luke is with me. But he's writing Timothy, and what does he say? Look at the next verse. Get Mark and bring him with you because he can help me in the work. I thought he didn't like Mark. Right. What happened? Funny how, funny how time heals old wounds. Okay. Well, why did he not like Mark earlier? He felt, he felt Mark wasn't serious and Mark wanted to go home, do something else other than the direction that Paul wanted to go at that time. Remember that back on Paul's first missionary journey when he was out with Barnabas, Barnabas was like a cousin of Mark. So the two of them w joined Paul and they went off. And when things started getting really difficult uh, and potentially dangerous, Mark decided it was time to go home. And Paul was not happy about it all. And so the next time when Paul said to Barnabas, let's go off on a second missionary journey, Barnabas says, okay, we'll take Mark with us. And Paul says, nothing doing. I'm not taking that guy. He, he flaked out on us on the first trip. Barnabas says, okay, I'll take him with me, and I'll go to the island of Crete, Cyprus, and maybe later to Crete. And what did, who did Paul take? Barnabas. He took, no, Barnabas took Mark. Silas. Yeah. Paul took Silas with him on his second and third missionary journeys. So, yes, and of course, later he, he added Timothy, and he added Luke, and others, many others at different times. So, but now he's down to his last affairs, We'll talk more about the final events of Paul's life a little bit later. But um, that was the circumstance. And Paul knew that, uh, by the way, um, what do you think Luke was doing there? How come he wasn't arrested? They were killing Christians right and left. How did Luke survive? Luke was a doctor. They needed him. <laughs> <laughs> no. no well, when that... Possible. I'm sure that the fact that he was a doctor gave him some additional leg up, maybe on, on the opposition. What else do we know about Luke? Of Greek. Yes, descent. Luke was a Greek. Luke was a Greek, and he could pose as a Greek doctor. And it was it was hard to sort of nail the the Christian Christianity thing on, on a Greek doctor. So apparently he was able to get away with this. What was Luke doing with Paul, by the way? We know dictation. Yeah, there's considerable evidence that Luke and, and Ellen White, I might add, says specifically that Luke stayed around to be Paul's amanuensis or secretary. So that's what, what was happening there in this last time. So now let's go back to uh, some of the earlier parts uh, in, in 2 Timothy. Uh, remembering Paul is in, his, in prison, what, what prospects does he have in this second imprisonment? Not much. We're not sure? It's kind of like death row, isn't it? Uh, pretty much like death row, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he knows that the chances of his escaping uh, unhurt from this trip around was probably zero. Well, but notice what he says in 2 Timothy 1, verse 3. I give thanks to God, whom I serve with a clear conscience, as my ancestors did. I thank him as I remember you always in my prayers night and day. I remember your tears, and I want to, to see you very much, so that I may be filled with joy. I remember the sincere faith you have, the kind of faith that your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice also had. I'm sure that you have it also. For this reason, I remind you to keep alive the gift that God gave you when I laid my hands on you. But the spirit that God has given us does not make us timid. Instead, his spirit fills us with power, love, and self-control. Do not be ashamed, then, of witnessing for our Lord. Neither be ashamed of me, a prisoner for Christ's sake, and so forth. Does that sound like someone who's cowering for his very life and afraid to speak a word? And Not the I fought a good fight. No. No. We're, we're, we're going to get to the I fought a good fight in a, in a little bit. Paul, Paul is not he's, not, he's not stepping down. He's not giving up at this point in time. He knows pretty well what his chances are. But he's saying, if God is on my side, what do I have to be afraid of? Nothing. Okay. And was that because he thought there was no chance he would be beheaded? 
What was it that Paul gave Paul sort of hope? Well, Jesus, that he would have a, a new home in heaven, a house not made by human hands, mm -hmm. God's, God's, God's mansion for, for us. Um, so why and how is Paul being so bold as to say, you know, bring these people and bring those people if there's this great um, persecution. persecution against Christianity? Yeah. Good question. It seems like it would be foolish to even, I mean, here, with, he's asking for some of the great church leaders of, of, you know, of that time to come to Rome to try to help him out when he knows that he's almost, he doesn't even know that they're going to make it to his place and before, he's, before he's destroyed. And we don't know. He says in, in uh, chapter 4, verse 6, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, yeah. and the time has come for my departure. Yep. But over in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8, where he says, So do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord, or ashamed of me, uh, the NI, my NIV version here says, ashamed of me, his prisoner, mm -hmm. Jesus' prisoner. So do we know that he wrote this in prison? Yes. This oh, there are other places that talks about him being in okay. prison, yes. Yeah. This is Paul's last letter. It's very bold of him to call for these church leaders to come yeah. and... Yeah. This is Paul's last letter. And this is, a, this is what we know about his final events. Whatever happened after this letter, we don't know. I mean, as far as, as, far as the inspired records are concerned. Uh, look at a couple of passages. Look at 2 Thessalonians uh, 2, verse 7. What was Paul worried about? 2 Timothy. Did I say, I'm sorry. Yeah, 2 Timothy. I, I'm sorry. 2 Timothy 2, verses 16 to 18. And compare that with 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 7. Look at 2, 16 to 18 here. Um, and I read, keep away from profane and foolish discussions which only drive people farther away from God. Such teachings like an open sore that eats away the flesh. Two men who have taught such things are Hymenaeus and Philetus. There's our Hymenaeus again. They have left the way of truth and are upsetting the faith of some believers by saying that our resurrection has already taken place. Powerful. Powerful words right there. Yeah. Every Christian ought to read that and think about what that actually says right there. Yeah. Which to me it it clearly says that these people are saying that the resurrection has already taken place, but how how many years after the resurrection of Christ is Second Timothy written? Second Timothy is probably written in late AD sixty seven or possibly early AD sixty eight. Christ's crucifixion was AD thirty one. So so we're talking, that's uh, 36, 37 years. But, but there was a resurrection. When yes. Jesus was resurrected, there were a number of open graves that people went back as the first fruits of the coming resurrection. Yes, yes. but this, this seems to say that they say that the resurrection, the, the main resurrection of, of all of Christ's followers has already taken place. But Paul is saying it yeah. has not. Yeah, exactly. It has not taken place. So, yeah. you know, many people today all around the world are, claim that the resurrection has already taken place. It seems like their gospel has, their false gospel has spread like gangrene. Yes. Is, is that from the Orient or is that around here? Here in, in uh, North America, in seems, seems to have uh, started in a big way. Are here. you saying? Are you saying that? Uh, Denominations believe that people who have died have just gone to heaven. Is that what he's saying, or is he saying something? There, else? No, there are there are groups that believe that the resurrection has already taken place. Or, well, some resurrection has already taken place, and that others will be are being raptured to heaven at any time. But how do they describe the event? Is it well, very different than we would describe the second coming, yes. But, but they, whatever it is, it's already been finished. Yes. Yeah. But we, we know, uh, just for safety's sake, I wanna, I'd like to say for anyone watching that doesn't know this, everywhere Old Testament, New Testament, it seems to be that the resurrection takes place at the last trumpet. Mm -hmm. And the last trumpet seems to be right when Jesus comes back. 
Yes, and if you look at Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, Revelation 1, lots of places in the, in the New Testament. I mean, the, the second coming is spoken of so many times in the New Testament. It's very clear, for example, Revelation 1, verse 7, every eye will see him. Yes. That's no secret yes. rapture. So we cannot be deceived. No. Yeah, very clear. Okay. So you wanted to compare this in Second Timothy two yeah. with uh, Second Thessalonians two. That was back to Paul's one of Paul's first writings. And what does it say there? Second text. Second Thessalonians two verse seven. The mysterious wickedness is already at work, mm -hmm. but what is going to happen will not happen until the one who holds it back is taken out of the way. Yes, and who would that be? Satan. Yeah, exactly. So one of the things we notice, we noticed in First Timothy, we're going to see it more here in Second Timothy as well, Paul speaks very personally about the devil. Romans, he says, you know, I wanted to go here, there, and different places earlier, but I couldn't because the de the de Satan prevented me. What, what is that, I mean, is, what is Satan's role in that kind of stuff? Could Satan literally prevent us from going somewhere? Well, at least he recognized that. A lot of people don't recognize it. They A lot of people in our day don't believe that the devil even exists. That's right. So he definitely believed he did exist, and he probably contended with him all the time. Well, he slowed down Gabriel. Yeah. Back in Daniel. Back in Daniel. Mm -hmm. So he could... Yeah. Um, going back to Second Timothy now. Um, look at uh, look at one of the one of the famous verses in Second Timothy is Second Timothy two fifteen. Norm, do you have that handy? I'd like you to read that. Do you have the King James? You have the New King James, right? New King James. Second Timothy two fifteen. Study to show thyself approved unto God, mm -hmm. a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Mm -hmm. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay, study to show thyself approved. How does how do you understand that? What does that mean? Is, is that talking about the study we do to prepare for this class? Well, he talked about a workman. He's a competent person. Uh -huh. So, to get to be a competent person, what do you do? You work. You work. Well, you study. And you, you learn how you, to do it. Yeah. You you look at it. You think about it. You do everything that needs to be done as far as to learn it. Okay. And rightly dividing the word of truth, I think, kind of puts the light back on those first sentences. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're, we're to study to find truth. Okay. And uh, not some kind of error that we would get by not rightly dividing the word of truth. Well, it's interesting because exactly the same word that's, word that's used there to study to show thyself approved is found over in chapter 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 9. See if you can guess where it's found in that verse. In 2 Timothy 4? 2 Timothy 4 okay. verse 9. Do your best to come to me soon. Do your best to come to me soon. Where's the study there? I don't see it. What happened oh, to it? It depends. You know, if you think God is the truth, aren't you coming closer to Him as Do you learn the truth? Yeah. Well, so, but we're, we're talking about the meaning of the word study here. What does it mean? It must have to do with the diligence. Do this says, "Do thy right. diligence to mm -hmm. come to me shortly." So, yeah. work at it. Uh -huh. uh, Gary was kind of be eager earlier, about that. Yeah. To, like a, a journeyman, if you will, on your way to becoming a professional, you have to do your best. You have to be diligent. In other words, it, for us to do that, we would need to study the scriptures. It wouldn't be wrong, probably, to say, uh, study to come to me shortly. Yeah. Well, let's talk about that a little bit. I, I, I'm sure, I for one, spent 
four years of my life living in dormitories in Christian schools. And this verse was often used to say, guys, dig in the book, study hard. Is that what this is supposed to mean? Well, your, your character also, not just not just reading or studying, but your character, your learning, fashioning your, your life. So would That's studying it. mathematics fit that? Okay. Mm -hmm. Towards okay. the Lord. That's reading the Bible, in my limited view, is different when you're approaching the Word than reading, a, reading other books. You have to be open to the Holy Spirit open to uh, that by yourself alone you may not understand it and be able to discern what you read properly and you have to kind of stay away from too much noise things that influence you really connecting with the Lord and if you keep doing that all the time God will show you what's correct what's right and what's wrong mm -hmm. I think so but it turns out that the Greek word here means literally, do your best. And that could be study. And, and over in chapter 4, I'm sure it just means, do your best to come to me soon. Yeah, Verse it, it 21, means, do your best to come before winter. Yeah, mm. exactly. Do your best to come before winter. Yeah. So that's what it's, it's not talking about. It, it's not it's exclusively, okay, open your books and study. It means do your best, and that could be study the books if that's the appropriate thing to do in this particular case, or it could be, you know, do your best, you know, hurry up, get here as quick as you can. Do your best. So that's what the word literally means in, in, in Greek. Um, what do we do with, chap I'm dropping back a little bit now, Second Timothy chapter 2. Look at uh, verse 8. Remember Jesus Christ who was raised from death, who was the son of David as I taught, as is taught in the, new, in the good news I preach. Because I preach the good news, I suffer and I am even chained like a criminal. That's another verse you asked about, was Paul in prison? Here's clearly another verse. But the word of God is not in chains. And so I endure everything for the sake of God's chosen people in order that they too may obtain the salvation that comes through Jesus Christ and brings eternal glory. This is a true saying, saying, if we have died with him, we shall also live with him. If we continue to endure, we shall also rule with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are not faithful, he remains faithful because he cannot be false to himself. What did Paul mean to, when he said the word of God is not in chains? Exactly what he said. Mm -hmm. God is all powerful. God has no restrictions on himself. His word is freedom. His word is life. Mm -hmm. Well, just because he's in chains doesn't mean that God's word is in chains. That's kind of what I hear from that. Well, well he's comparing his condition yeah. with the, the expanse and the freedom of God's word that's going on. Do you think Paul felt guilty at all for converting all those people in Rome and then being responsible, at least partly, for their death? No. All the people who died in Rome for being Christians? They just went to sleep. Mm -hmm. And they received a blessing. Okay. Eternal life. Yeah, he, he's, he is not considering that he's diminished because he's going to die for the gospel. Mm -hmm. Why would he consider that they were diminished because they died for the gospel? Exactly. Exactly. So, I mean... This is a reflection of something we've talked about earlier when we're talking about the book of Acts, how the disciples changed when Jesus rose from the dead. And what happened? They said, death is no longer something to be afraid of. God can, God can take us you know, back to heaven. From Don't, don't worry about that. Uh, if, if your head gets chopped off, what's going to be your next thought? Here comes Jesus, right? The next thing you know, he's on his way. So that's not something that we need to be afraid of. Why would we be afraid of that? So, Jesus, I mean, Paul here is really saying the word of God is, if you're, if you're bound, you're, you're confined to, say, the Mamertine prison. If you're not bound, what do you do? 
You travel wherever you want freely. Was the word of God spreading like wildfire in those days, yes. even though Paul was confined to the Mamertine prison? That's yes. the point he's making. It, it, it certainly was. It was going like gangbusters. Yes. Why do you, and, and that raises a huge question, which Paul sort of alludes to in several places in this, in this book. Why do you suppose it is, as has been suggested many, generations, I mean millennia ago, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church? Why is that? The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Good fertilizer. Good fertilizer? Don't think... Well, if things are going well in a person's life, they don't have any reason to change. But if they observe that uh, people have died for the, for the uh, truth, uh, makes people reevaluate their position. When they see something that somebody believes in so strongly that they would die for it, that often raises a question, what on earth are they talking about? Yeah. What is that? Why is it worth that much? And, and how seriously did they take their religion? Yeah. I mean, if you know that you could be sentenced to death for what you believe at any moment, you better be pretty sure about what you believe, right? Mm -hmm. you no, know, sometimes I wonder about our value of life today as opposed to back then. Yeah. Um, did they really know that death was part of life mm -hmm. back then more than they do now. Seems like today we, we just try to put it out of our mind and think that it isn't going to happen, you know, until mm -hmm. it finally happens. What was life But I wonder I wonder if back then, you know, death was just part of life and but the good news came and just made it even better. Mm -hmm. And so it was it was easier to go through it. If 60% of the uh, population was in slavery, and what was the lifespan? Yeah, well, uh, it, that's difficult to, to, to estimate, but uh, people have tried, and because there were so many children died in early, early years back in those days, the life, average life expectancy was, is estimated to be down maybe in the 30s or early 40s. But that's partly because so many children died at a very early age. So, but it was pretty unusual for people to live to be old age in those days because there were no antibiotics, there was none of the medical care that we have available, no surgery, no nothing. If you, anything like that happened to you, you know, good luck, you know. So, um, Ellen White talks about that issue of, of the gospel, I mean the blood of the church, uh, blood and waters being the seed of the church in the sense that when people really, really believe, and when you're threatened with your life, if you are a Christian, it causes a shaking. Isn't that amazing? People who aren't sure that they really want to be Christians are weeded out of the church. Now, initially that does what to the church? Shrinks it down. That's what the shaking is all about. But then what happens when you get a relatively pure church and everybody who's there really believes what they what really understands it and believes what they believe, then those people, it, it's like a fire. And there's plenty of evidence that that kind of, of situation is going to happen again at the very end of time. And what we call the latter rain. The latter rain happens right after what? The shaking, right? It's con part of that. So w when we come right back, we're going to look at the rest of the book of Second Timothy. Don't go away.
Welcome back. We're so glad that you decided to stay by. We're looking at the last, probably the last month or two of the life of Paul. Certainly the last two years when he was in prison in very unfavorable circumstances in Rome. And the first thing I want to look at is 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. We're getting down close to the end, and Norm read us that at the beginning of our session. Let me read it to you again. I'm going to read from the Good News Bible. All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching the truth, rebuking error, correcting faults, and giving instruction for right living, so that the people who serve God may be fully qualified and equipped to do every kind of good deed. Now, the question which arises when you look at that verse is, what Scripture was Paul talking about? Did um, he have a nice... See, I have this beautiful edition of the Good News Study Bible that I, um, I've worn the cover out twice, and I had this beautiful binding put on here for about $120. Uh, and I hope this one's going to last longer than the previous ones did. <laughs> uh, but we have, you know, here's all of Scripture with lots of study notes and other thing in there. Um, beautifully bound, wonderful. Did Paul have one of those in his possession? No. No. What did he have? Scrolls. 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 Scrolls of oh. the Old Testament. What we call how, the Old how many Testament. of those could you carry in your pocket? None. None. And, uh, and memorization from the oral tran uh, sure. tradition of passing the scriptures. It's on. very likely that Paul had memorized much of the Old Testament. There's some hint in some places that there were people, and maybe Paul was one of them, who memorized the entire Old Testament in Hebrew. That would be amazing if someone could actually do that. But there are those who claim that that was possible. Um, obviously, their mind wasn't distracted by a million other things like ours are. Um, I, well, so what, maybe what? we would do a lot better off if we, we would be a lot better off if we spent more time memorizing Scripture. Mm -hmm. Yes? Well, what, what was the, the question you were okay. getting at here? So here's, the, uh, 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 here's my question. What Scripture? Remembering Scripture means writings. It means writing. We have a lot of um, a lot of words, even in English, that use script to mean writings. Um, so that's that's what the Greek word means. So what writings is Paul talking about here? The ones that are inspired by God. Yes. Okay. Well, um, in 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 the original Greek, let me let me pronounce it for you: pasagraphe theopneustas. <laughs> you do, and you'll clean it up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it means every writing God breathed, and then it goes on to talk about what it's going to be, what's going to happen if you if you have those every God breathed writing. And the question is this: Does this mean every writing that is God breathed is inspired? Does it mean all writing is inspired and therefore is God breathed? The former. We, we have some pretty good evidence that there's some writing that's not God-breathed. And what writing was going around in Paul's day? Because that, be that would be the stuff he would be talking to Timothy about, wouldn't it? All the, all, Gnosticism. Yeah. Okay. All those. And are there, are there parts of Scripture that might have been going around that um, claim to be inspired that we wouldn't think were very inspired today? Well, the, even the Apocrypha was, uh, yeah. was available at that time, and then yeah. there were pseudepigraphical books that were available, uh, materials, so and so. Parts of the Old Testament, what we would call the Old Testament editions there, the Old Testament Apocrypha was recognized as deuterocanonical by Roman Catholics. Uh, most Protestants say, no, we don't accept those as being inspired, but they were going around in, in, in Paul's day. So do you think Timothy, and I might add, there are many, Christ well, virtually all Christian groups, including, including Roman Catholics, if you ask them about the inspiration of Scripture, they turn to this verse. And they read it and they say, you see, this is proof that this whole Bible is inspired, including our Apocrypha. And what do we say? So, so why didn't the translators use all writings? Well, because they don't want you to say they know. Scripture, because we know... There is a difference between writings and scripture as far as we're concerned. As far as we're concerned. And they use that as a translation. 
So they must have had a reason to do that. Yeah, sure Is they did. Is it just their bias? Well, here's, here's the problem. Uh, I'll be very honest with you. There are many Christians who somehow feel, especially some who favor the King James Version, that somehow or other it floated down from the clouds, you know, in perfect form uh, to St. James, they would have called him, um, and, and, you know, unpolluted, you know, no, no historical problems back behind it. And that just isn't true. Uh, those who know about the history of what, of how the Bible came along, and I'm not having any accusations against King James, it just, ha just happens to be the first, well, the most widely recognized English version, and had enormous influence in shaping the English language which we speak. Between, I mean, between Tyndall and Coverdale, who did, who did the, the, the Bible in English, and Shakespeare, who did all his writings in English, Basically, those contemporaries basically solidified the English language. I mean, sure, it's changed some quite a bit from then, but we can still read their writings in their context and still understand them fairly good. If you take the writings of Wycliffe, who lived, what, 120 years earlier, most of that you wouldn't be able to read. So, um, what's the essence of the problem that you're talking about here. Well, let me, let me see if I can clarify that problem for you. There is a, you know, there is a, a version of the New Testament and called the New Testament of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as revised and corrected by the spirits. And the verses in there, just like that. Revised and corrected by the spirits. And at the beginning of that book, at the opening, in the introduction to that volume, uh, which has been considerably shortened, it's not even as long as our New Testament, it says this, Dear reader, trust in God, who made all things after the counsel of his own will. The Holy Spirits, plural, feel much interest in this work, and the Spirits, plural, who corrected it, desire that the world will receive this correction as coming from them, directed by God himself, which is true, signed, Jesus the Christ. So obviously that one's more inspired than this one we have in front of us, right? The Gospel of John in that translation drops off right around the middle. It doesn't yeah. have many of our favorite yeah. verses in the Gospel of John. Exactly. It's, uh, and that was about 1850, what was 1861, it? 1861, I think. It was 1861, okay. Yeah, beginning of the Civil War. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, um, so what does that tell us? I mean... If we're just going to accept this as all scriptures inspired by God, that's a claim. Well, at the, I'd like to add also in the same chapter, the verse prior to that, it says, and how from, uh, from verse 15, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, yeah. which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus, all scriptures God breathed. Yeah. And so it could be talking about uh, clearly, what what they had known as the scriptures, what we would call the Old Testament. Right. So, in so, other words, they had something in mind when he said that word. Yes. Yes. You know, it wasn't yeah. just general, like like Let, the let's, meaning would. Let's say. let's look at a couple of examples that would, that would clarify that. Look at Luke twenty four forty four. Now, this obviously was still back in the time when Jesus. Well, it was after Jesus had died and been resurrected. He's what he's talking to the man on the road to Emmaus, um, and then, then to the disciples in the upper room. 24 what? Um, 44. 44. And then he said to them, these are the very things I told you about while I was still with you. Everything written about me in the, laws of Mo the law of Moses, which books would that be? Pentateuch. Yes. The Pentateuch, the five books of Moses. The writings of the prophets, what books are those? Major and minor prophets. The major, most of the most of what we call major and minor prophets. Although the minor prophets, some of those would be over in what we call the writings, which is the the third section, and um, the uh, and the Psalms had to come too. Psalms was the first book in that third division. So th this is important for Christians to understand that there was this collection of books that we would call our Old Testament. Jews would call their Tanakh. That collection of books is already coming together pretty clearly in Jesus' day, okay? So, 
Jesus is saying to Timothy, not, you know, whatever you read is inspired. No, Paul was saying, Timothy, you know which books are in God, God breathed. You know which books are inspired. You know, those are the ones you need to take and use as you're instructing church leaders, as you're instructing church members, etc., in, in, in the various places where you travel. There was no New Testament at the time Paul wrote that. No. And there was a few of his letters. Well, it was beginning to, there were beginning to be a few letters, yeah. But, but there were, we didn't No, have New Testament, Matthew no. Or any of those uh, no. books. No, no. The Gospels. So this is, a, this is a verse not about all scriptures inspired. This is a verse about if you know what's inspired, that material is useful for doctrine and teaching and so forth and so forth. That's what this verse means as opposed to, we have to be careful about just accepting claims because obviously, like the, the paragraph I read to you from the New Testament inspired by the spirits, or revised by the spirits, there's some outlandish claims out there, and if you start reading the Old Testament Apocrypha, the Old Testament Pseudepigrapha, and then if you go to the New Testament Apocrypha, wow! <laughs> that was some really wild stuff. And that was all there, or at least most of, much of it was there in, in, in Timothy's day. And Paul is saying, Timothy, you know which is the good stuff and which is the bad stuff. And the Maccabees, I spent three years going through the Maccabees. Really? Mm -hmm. Yes. So there's several translations that say effectively every scripture inspired yeah. by God is also useful yes. here for... Yeah. And it's interesting that even Tyndall, the very first, well, the very first English translation directly from the Greek, because Wycliffe's Bible, which was earlier, was from the Latin Vulgate. Tyndall's first translation of the New Testament from Greek says, for all scripture given by inspiration of God is profitable, da 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 da. So he had it right clear right back in the first. beginning. Yep. Yeah. So, and in my Good News Bible, the footnote says, every scripture inspired by God is also useful, and so forth. That's the footnote. So it can be taken either way, but Almost certainly, Paul, this is not some claim. This is Paul saying, Timothy, you know how to distinguish the good from the bad. Okay? I'd like to drop, I mean, drop back a little bit at the beginning of that chapter and read these verses. I'm sure you've heard many sermons on this. Remember that there will be difficult times in the last days. People will be selfish, greedy, boastful, and conceited. They will be insulting, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, and irreligious. They will be unkind, merciless, slanders, violent, and fierce. And I can stop in the middle here a little bit. And, and this reminds us of Paul, Romans 1, and other places like this. When Paul starts reeling off the sins, he has a hard time stopping. <laughs> Just one, one sin after another after another. Here, they will be teachers, rec, uh, they will be um, treacherous, Reckless and swollen with pride, they will love pleasure rather than God. They will hold to the outward form of religion of our religion, but reject its real power. Keep away from such people. Some of them go into people's houses and gain control over weak women who are burdened by the guilt of their sins and driven by all kinds of of desires, etc. Women who are always trying to learn, etc. Uh, do you think that describes any time that we might be familiar with? Hmm. Is it possible that people living in our day might love pleasure more than they love God? Sounds an awful lot like today, doesn't it? Yes. You think Paul had any idea that we would still be here 2,000 years later? No. I don't think that entered his mind. No, not a chance. But boy, are we seeing it today. Wow. So you don't think Paul understood the 2300-day prophecy? Well, God said it was a sealed book, didn't he? Mm-hmm. I, Paul I don't took that literally. Yeah. Or actually, that wasn't written when Paul... When Paul yeah. No, it was. Yes, that was from Daniel. Yeah, it was from Daniel, yeah. yeah. So, Ken, of what you just read uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, very interesting, verse 5, having a form of godliness, mm -hmm. but denying its power. What do you suppose that means? They're looking like God, they're looking like their followers and their, I don't want to say preachers, but, you know, espousing that, mm -hmm. but they deny, they're they denying the power. Mm -hmm. So they don't believe that there's any power. It's not accomplishing in them what it's supposed to. Yes, yeah, not doing anything. Um, would you like to make a guess about what percentage of Christians would fit into that category in our day? 
I'd hate, I'd hate to do that because it would put Christians in a bad light, <laughs> but um, probably uh, a yeah, vast majority. So what would you see if they were displaying the power? Well, my, my comment about that would be if there was a sufficient group of Christians really who had accepted God and were displaying His power, we would, we would quickly be in the kingdom of heaven. We wouldn't be here anymore. That would be That's my... That's a jump over though, but yeah. you said that were displaying their power. What would it be that would be displayed? Well, Jesus himself said, you know, if we're really, you know, well, he calls about setting your lamp up on, you know, in the house, set up in the house, don't hide under a bushel, and those kinds of things back in the Sermon on the Mount. And he said, if we were really witnessing to God, people would look at us and they would praise God. So thus, Jesus would have already come back because the whole world would have already been believing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The... Uh you put that in the positive. Mm -hmm. If God had this group of people that were doing it to them, you can look at it from the from the negative side also, because mm -hmm. it's probably happening about the same time. But uh, in another one of Ellen White's statements, time will last a little longer until the inhabitants of Earth have filled up the cup of their iniquity. Then the wrath of God, which so long slumbered, will awake, and this land of light will drink the cup of his unmingled wrath. Yeah. And in Christ's object lessons, but there is a line beyond which they cannot pass. Time is near <clears throat> when they have reached the prescribed limit. Even now they have almost exceeded the bounds of long suffering of God, the limits of his grace, the limits of his mercy. Yeah. What, what's the page on that one? 177.5. Okay. okay. So there are things that are that that those people that you're talking about, when they do what they're supposed to, there will be an immediate response by the rest of the world, and I think this describes yeah. describes that. Well, the 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 passage, the place I think of instinctively when someone talks about you know what should have happened or what could happen in, in these last days of this world's history is the section in uh, Ministry of Healing. I mean, I'm sorry, Testimonies to Ministers. I'm sorry, Evangelism. It's a, the book Evangelism, page 694 to 697, The Reason for the Delay. And right there it says, there had already been long delay by the year 1868, she says, and then she says, we should have been in the Kingdom of God before 1883. We could have ere this been in the kingdom of God before 1883. Now, if that doesn't make you want to sit up and take notice. I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure what the numbers were at that time. But today, if you counted all Christians of all different faiths and denominations, Catholic, Protestant, and, and everyone else, we've got about one-third of planet Earth. Mm -hmm. who's claiming Jesus Christ. Yeah. So if we were all, all on fire, as you had mentioned, and, and as it's mentioned, you know, many places, Jesus would have already come back. Yeah. If one-third of planet Earth was on fire and well, telling people about Jesus in love and in grace, in gentleness and in kindness, but in power, yeah. he would have already come back because well, people would and have think, believed. And think of the difficulties that Paul and his associates faced when they tried to, and their, even their enemies said, these people have turned the world upside down in one generation. And look at all the, I mean, we have the internet, we have TV, we have radio, we have telephones, we have tra easy transportation, we have airlines, we have everything go in our favor. What are we doing to turn the world upside down? Well, we need to spend the last few minutes we have on Second Timothy to talk a little bit about the final events in Paul's life, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. And um, I'm going to read the first few verses. In the presence of God and of Christ, who will judge the living and the dead, and because he is coming to rule as king, I solemnly urge you to preach the message, to insist upon proclaiming it. I mean, this is Paul is about to have his head cut off, okay? Uh, whether the time is right or not, to convince, reproach, and encourage as you teach with all patience. The time will come when people will not listen to sound doctrine. 
Does that sound at all familiar? But will follow their own desires and will collect for themselves more and more teachers who will teach them what they are itching to hear. Does that sound like anybody we've heard of today, we think about today, might think about today? They will turn away from listening to the truth and give their attention to the legends. But you must keep control of yourselves in all circumstances, and during suffering, do the work of a preacher of the good news, perform your whole duty as a servant of God. As for me, the hour has come for me to be sacrificed. The time is here for me to leave this life. What is Paul saying? He knows this is the end for him. Yeah. He's in prison. The, the emperor has accused him. Mm -hmm. The emperor, mm -hmm. you know, the emperor gets his will. Yeah. I think the spirit kind of let him know that, too. It wasn't, I mean, because God could do anything. He could start an earthquake again and free yeah, right. him again. Sure. But I think he, he knew that um, things yeah. fit to go where he was, thought he yeah. was going yeah. there. Yeah. 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 I have done my best in the race. I have run the full distance, and I have kept the faith. Do you think we have any Pauls alive today? Yes, I do. Do you think you could name any? I won't, but I think I could. Okay. Good. There are people, and there need to be a lot more people who have this kind of conviction. That's right. And really, I mean, I think if we had even a relatively small number who, who had this kind of an approach and really had the, had the go understood the gospel clearly from Scripture and I would add the writings of Ellen White, then marvelous things would happen. Ken, if, if I might be able to say something about the Scripture you just mm -hmm. read, chapter 4, verse 6, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. I want to read... 7 and, and 8 there, but I'd like to make the point, you know, Paul always seems to be saying, oh, I'm a wretched man, I've got a long ways to go, I've got so much to do. He's not saying that here. No. He, he knows it's his time, and he says, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, mm -hmm. I have kept the faith, mm -hmm. now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, mm -hmm. which the Lord uh, the righteous judge will award me on that day, and not only to me, and here's some softening, he's, you know, he's usually pretty hard, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Now, that's a very interesting point, those who long for his appearing. Would that be the people who have already been taken to heaven? If they've longed for his appearing? Oh, oh. no, no, they've... Yes. Yeah. See, this is a verse that suggests that people will, are still waiting. Right, right, yes. Some have, many have died. Yes. They're still in the grave. They're still waiting. Okay? Well, then these verses that sound not quite to that kind of standard, do your best to come to me soon. Do you need to be inspired to say that? Demas fell in love with this present world and has des deserted me going off to Thessalonica. Crescens went to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he can help me in the work. I sent Tychicus to Ephesus. While, uh, when you come, bring my coat that I left in Troas with Carpus. Bring the books too and especially the ones that made a parchment. Why would Paul ask Timothy to bring these precious documents that other people could use to him in Rome, where they would probably just be destroyed. Well, maybe not. Maybe there were people in Rome who could use them. That's a possibility. And he wanted to look at them again. He wasn't sure how long he was going to be there. He loved the Lord. He loved reading the Scripture. It may have been part of his, his research and writing program. Yeah. Maybe also transcribing them for others, creating yeah. extra documents. Well, but if you were in the Mamertine prison, I mean, it's amazing that he was able to write anything out of there. Probably only with the help of Luke, would be my guess. He was able to get anything out of there. He, he, I, you know, remember that paper, anything to write on, parchment. I mean, that's, the, that's the made from the skins of unborn animals. I mean, that's expensive stuff. And what kind of income does Paul have at this point? A bit limited. A bit limited. <laughs> Yeah, there are still people trying to help him, but, I mean, it's pretty limited. Yes, exactly. Well, moving on. 
Alexander the metal worker did me great harm. The Lord will reward him according to what he has done. But be on your guard against him yourself, because he was violently opposed to our message. And that was, of course, back in Ephesus. No one stood by me the first time I defended myself. All deserted me. May God not count it against them. So Paul has already been up once before Nero in this second imprisonment. And apparently nothing could be sustained against him. But the Lord stayed with me and gave me strength so that I was able to proclaim the full message for all the Gentiles to hear. The full message for all the Gentiles to hear? Wow. And I was rescued from being sent to death, and the Lord will rescue me from all evil and take me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I send greetings to Priscilla and Aquila and to the family of Owen and Sepphoris. Erastus stayed in Corinth, and I left Trophimus and Miletus because he was sick. Do your best to come before winter. Would you need to be inspired to say that? Well, he wants his cloak. Yes. <laughs> Eubulus, Putins, Linus, and Claudia send their greetings. And so do all the other Christians. The Lord be with your spirit. God's grace be with you all. And that was Paul's final words. He did nothing, nothing more written from Paul that we're aware of after that. So what do we learn from the second book of, of Paul? Well, we learn that um, Jesus paid the price. He did what was necessary to win our salvation. His life and his death give us a picture of what our choices are to live the kind of loving life he lived or we will die the death he died. Christian women in Paul's day were advised not to wear jewelry, we mentioned that earlier, either to show off their family's wealth or to advertise their prostitution as in the fertility cult religions. God wants all Christians to demonstrate by their lives that they are sons and daughters of the heavenly king. They don't need expensive ornaments to demonstrate that. Having wealth is one of the most dangerous things that can happen to us, the love of money as the root of all evil. God and Paul challenges us, challenge us to do our best in teaching and preaching the gospel to all around us. We are advised to carefully evaluate anything claiming to be from God. Only that which is consistent with the rest of Scripture is to be believed and followed. Beware of religious claims. These two documents from Paul to Timothy were originally personal letters. Christians recognize their spiritual significance, recognize their spiritual significance, and thus they have been preserved in study. The fact that Paul had some personal information included reminds us that it was originally a letter to a friend. Don't you wish you had a friend that could write you a letter like that? We'll see you next time.